All right, everyone. So our next chapter that we're focused on is about the electronic structure of atoms. Um, so really what we're doing here is we're talking mostly about the electrons. So, like I said, we're focused on the electrons and where they are arranged in the atom. So we've talked about before how electrons um, are on are outside of the nucleus, but we don't know more particularly what that means. So, before we can talk about that, we do have to still understand um, about light a little bit. So, electromagnetic radiation is a form of energy that has wave characteristics and travels through a vacuum at a characteristic speed of 2.998 times 10 to the 8th, so make sure you make that an exponent right there, okay, um, meters per second, okay, um, which is the speed of light. Um, so, when we look at a wave, some things to be aware of are some terms are one, what is known as a wavelength. So the wavelength is the distance between two peaks. So from here to here, or it can also be between um, the troughs as well. So down at the bottom, from there to there, okay, um, which is known as a wavelength. We also have something which is known as the frequency of a wave, which relates to the number of wavelengths or cycles that pass a given point each second. Um, so don't get confused, frequency is not about speed, because we know that all light travels actually at the same speed, um, but it's kind of about how squashed the wave is together, how close it is. Um, so we'll look at that here in a second. Okay, so we have this inverse relationship that's key here with our waves. So notice that if I draw a wave that has a long wavelength, in result, it has a low frequency. On the opposite side, if I draw a wave that has a short wavelength, <laughs> it has a high frequency. Um, there's no possible way to have a long wave with a high frequency. They are inverse to each other. So from this, we have an equation, which is C, our speed of light, is equal to wavelength, and this is the Greek symbol for wavelength, times frequency. And that's a Greek symbol for frequency. It's, it's kind of like a V. Okay, um, so this is wavelength, and this one means wavelength, and this one means frequency. Um, this equation is given to you on your formula chart, so it's not one we need to memorize, we're just going to need to know how to use it, which we'll practice on Tuesday. Okay, so the electromagnetic spectrum shows us the entire all the different types of waves that we have, everywhere from radio waves to gamma rays. Um, so notice that radio waves on this end of the spectrum um, have very long wavelengths, so in a result, they have a very low frequency. And then as we travel down through the spectrum, we, get, we see visible light is here in the middle, um, which is our rainbow, right? If you remember Roy G. Biv, um, that's the order of our visible light spectrum. And then all the way down to gamma, which is our highest in energy um, because of its short wavelength and high frequency. Um, notice how much it changes. It's pretty crazy, too, and we'll talk more about this on Tuesday. But a radio wave is about the length of a football field. Um, and then when we get all the way down to and gamma, um, they're the size of an atomic nucleus, which is pretty crazy. Alright, so go ahead and just try this problem for me, and in, for each of the options given, just circle the one with the, that is the highest in energy. Um, remember that high energy, you can think of in two ways. It means either short wavelength or high frequency, right? So go ahead and circle each of those, and then for every one you get right, you can have a smiley face. All right, so for the first one, we think Roy G. Biv, which means green, is the one you should have circled. Um, X-ray to UV, X-rays are higher in energy. Um, you may also see some sort of correlation that the higher in energy it is, typically the more dangerous it is, it is to us as humans. Um, between blue and yellow, once again, Roy G. Biv, blue is higher in energy. And then between visible and the infrared spectrum, visible is higher in energy. 
All right, go ahead and give yourself a smiley face for each one you got right. Okay, so there are three different experiments or discoveries that have led us to our quantum model of an atom today that we need to understand first. So there is this phenomenon which still happens today that kind of perplexed scientists. Um, they noticed that when solid objects were heated, they emitted radiation, um, such as simply like when you're roasting s'mores and you stick your thing in the fire and it gets, the metal turns red. Um, and they were confused by this. So in 1900, a scientist named Max Planck discovered why this happens. Um, and so what he did is he gave the name quantum, which means fixed amount, to the smallest quantity of energy that can be emitted or absorbed as electromagnetic radiation. And through this, he developed an important equation, which to calculate the energy of radiation, so that's E, we can do it. Energy is equal to h which is a constant times frequency okay um, energy is equal to h which is known as Planck's constant times frequency so notice this relationship here how energy and frequency are directly related the higher the frequency the higher the energy um, and once again that is con it's a constant so it doesn't change um, the constant which this equation and the constant are both given to you on your formula sheet so you don't need to memorize them but it's 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times seconds. Oops. Joules times seconds. So that's Planck's constant. Um, because energy is only released in specific amounts, we can say that the allowed energies are quantized um, or their values are restricted to certain quantities. So a second phenomenon that people wanted to know more about um, in 1905 was known, well, they wanted to know before, but it's known as the photoelectric effect. So this was the effect where they noticed where if they shined um, light on a metal surface that they could get electrons to come flying off. But they noticed that it didn't happen all the time and it was different for each type of metal. So notice this one is particular for potassium. So, a guy named Einstein in 1905, 1905 used Planck's theory to help explain this effect. Um, and so, he discovered that a minimum frequency of light, which was different for every metal, was required to get the electrons to emit. So, for example, on this one, the red light, due to its higher wavelength and lower frequency, could not get electrons to emit but the green light and then our blue-violet light was able to due to their higher frequency. So there's some sort of minimum frequency that had to happen or it didn't matter, okay? Um, and from this, Einstein said that the radiant energy striking the metal surface behaves like a stream of tiny packets of energy called photons. So really the same exact equation, but rather than just focusing on it as energy, we now focus it on as the energy <coughs> of a photon. Equals that same equation, H times frequency. So if a photon strikes the metal and it has less energy than the work function, which is that minimum energy electrons do not escape, even if the light beam is really intense. So even if it was a really, really intense red light, um, it still doesn't have enough energy to make an electron escape. Um, and so from this, Einstein concluded an interesting relationship, how light can behave as a wave, but also somewhat as a particle as well. So there's this dual characteristic of light. All right, and then our last one, in 1913, Niels Bohr offered an explanation for line spectra. So a spectrum in general is produced when radiation such from such sources is separated into its component wavelengths, like a rainbow, right? A rainbow is a continuous spectrum because it has all the wavelengths possible. Um, 
On the other hand, a spectrum that only has specific wavelengths is known as a line spectrum or an emission spectrum or emission lines. Um, so notice that in this one that we just see very particular wavelengths. Um, and it's very particular, right? We see that red has a variety of wavelengths, but this is a particular wavelength that is being emitted. Um, and it's known as a line spectrum. Um, we're going to find, and we'll see this on Tuesday, uh, as we look at different line spectrums, but a line spectrum is actually very unique to an element. Um, it's almost like a fingerprint for it. Okay, so from his observation, Bohr developed his model of the atom. So his model of the atom is based on these three things. One, only orbits of a certain radii corresponding to certain specific energies are permitted for an electron in a hydrogen atom. Number two, an electron in a permitted orbit is in an allowed energy state. An electron in an allowed energy state does not radiate energy and therefore does not spiral into the nucleus. So when an electron is in what we'll call its ground state, um, it doesn't lose energy past that point. It stays there. And then three, energy is emitted or absorbed by an electron only as the electron changes from one allowed energy state to another and the energy is emitted or absorbed as a photon. So we'll look here at a picture to better understand this. So this right here, this is Bohr's model of an atom, and it's probably the most common one that we'll look at and often draw and model. Okay, so notice that each orbit corresponds to a different value of n, which is known as the principal quantum number. So the first ring here is known as n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, so on and so forth. So as the radius gets bigger, our n is increasing. The lowest, the, ener the lowest energy state is known as the ground state. And when an electron is in a higher energy state, um, we call it that it's in an excited state. Um, so when an electron moves up, um, it is now in an excited state. Okay. So depending on the energy change, we can tell whether a photon is absorbed or emitted. Um, relate this back to our endo and exothermic unit where when delta H was positive, that meant energy was going in. So if E is greater than zero, that means energy is going in or a photon is being absorbed. Okay. Um, if a photon is being absorbed, then that allows an electron to jump up or move up in energy levels and become excited, right? Um, just like when you, when you get energy, you are more likely to be excited. And then when delta E is less than zero, that means the photon is being emitted. And as that photon is emitted, the electron then must fall down back to its ground state or to a lower energy state. Um, when you lose energy, you become less excited, just like atoms, electrons. Um, even though this model has limitations, it's important... It's an important step into what we have today about our atoms, so we're thankful for it. All right, so in 1926, which is less than 100 years ago, um, Erwin Schrodinger proposed an equation um, that incorporates this wave-like and particle-like behaviors of the electrons. Um, Schrodinger's model of the atom is extremely complicated. His equation is amazing, um, but it's not something we're going to get to in this class. If you choose to ke study chemistry later on, you'll learn more about Schrodinger, which is a lot of fun. Um, but what we need to know is his work brought about a way of dealing with subatomic particles known as quantum mechanics. Um, the quantum mechanical model of the atom is basically the truest model of the atom we have today. Um, in Schrodinger's model, we talk about it in terms of a probability. Um, the probability that an electron will be in a certain region of space at a given instant so rather than like in Bohr's model where we have these rings, right, rather than like having these tracks that electrons stay in, it's more about the space. Um, and so what we have for Schrodinger's model is this electron density distribution, um, which shows that the more dense the dots, the higher the probability of finding an electron in that space. So through Schrodinger's equation, um, we develop, like we said, the quantum mechanical model. His model uses three quantum numbers to describe an orbital. Okay, 
So my analogy that I'm going to use to hopefully help us better understand this is I'm going to relate an atom to a hotel, okay? So in Schrodinger's model of the atom, the first thing is we have what is known as the principal quantum number n, which is, like we talked about on Bohr's, in a sense, these rings, right? Where n equals 1, n equals 2, so on and so forth. Um, the collection of orbitals within the same value of n are called electron shells. Um, and then within those, we have subshells. So my, for my analogy, um, our atom is a hotel. The principal quantum number n are like the floors of our hotel. Okay? And then with on each floor, we have rooms, which the rooms of our hotel are represented by the quantum number L, okay? Uh, technically, this should be like a cursive L, so we can tell the difference. Okay, the quantum number L is the angular momentum quantum number, which defines the shape of an orbital. Um, L can have values anywhere from 0 to n minus 1 for each of the values of n. Um, the set of orbitals that has the same n and l values are called subshells. So our subshells are like our rooms on the floor. So these rooms, rather than signifying them by numbers, we signify them by letters. So when l equals 0, the letter we use is s. When l equals 1, it means it's a p subshell. L equals 2 means it's a D subshell, and then L equals 3 is an F subshell. Um, so, for example, the first subshell, N equals 1, consists of only one subshell, which would be the 1S, or basically saying on the first floor of our hotel, there is one room known as the 1S room. All right, so then in each of our rooms, we have bunk beds. Okay, so our next quantum number um, is known as the quantum ma magnetic quantum number, which is M, and this should be a subscript L, okay, which describes the orientation of the orbitals in space. And we'll look at some pictures of these here in a second. Um, an M sub L can have values between negative L to positive L, okay, including zero. Um, so we have the floors of our hotel on each floor, there are rooms, and then in each room, there are bunk beds. So let's talk about how we know how many bunk beds and how many rooms are on each floor. All right, so first floor, n equals 1. So we know that the possible values of L are from 0 to n minus 1. So if n equals 1, then the only possible values for L are 0 which means when L equals 0, the subshell destination is S, okay? Which means the possible values of M sub L, these range from L to negative L. So once again, if it's 0, then the only numerical values are 0. So we only have one bunk bed in our, sorry, put a 1 here, 1S one room, okay? which means a total of one orbital. Okay, second floor of a hotel. On the second floor of a hotel, there's two possible values of L, because L could be one or L could be zero, right? Because it's from zero to N minus one, which means on the second floor, we have a two P room and a two S room. Okay, in the two S room, um, there, the numerical values of m sub l would just be 0, which means that's just one orbital or one bunk bed. Okay, In the 2p room, though, since the value for l is 1, um, that means it could be anywhere. It could be 1, 0, and negative 1, which means there are three bunk beds in our 2p room, so a total of four orbitals on the second floor. All right, we go to the third floor of our hotel. So on the third floor of our hotel, that means we have two, one, and zero. 
which means there's a 3S room, a 3P room, and a 3D room, okay? Once again, notice that all S rooms, no matter what floor they're on, if it's S, it's always going to be quantum number M sub L equals zero, which means just one orbital. Same thing with P. Um, any P subshell, whether whatever floor it's on, has the same values. So it'd be one, zero, negative one, which means there are three bunk beds or orbitals in the 3P. So for D, that means the range is, it could be two, one, zero, negative one, or negative two, um, which gives us the capability of five orbitals or five bunk beds in that room. So a grand total of nine orbitals. Do you see a pattern coming here? All right, so then for our fourth floor of our hotel, it could be three, two, one, zero, which means we have a 4S, a 4P, a 4D, whoops, and a 4F. So there are four rooms on the fourth floor, right? Notice, first floor, one room. Second floor, two rooms. Third floor, three rooms. Fourth floor, four rooms. Actually, at this point, the pattern stays the same. Um, at least for the biggest atoms we have, it doesn't go past four rooms, and we'll kind of see that as we move on. But this pattern does stay the same, right? That if it's an S room, there's one orbital. P rooms have three. D rooms have five. And F rooms, one, three, five, have seven. Um, because our different options for numerical values are negative three, negative two, oh, or positive three, positive two, positive one, zero, one, two, three, and then our D, P, and S would be the same as above, which gives us a total of 16 total orbitals. Um, don't feel the need to memorize this chart here, okay? Um, there's a really cool trick on the periodic table that we'll use here in a second that actually shows this pattern quite well. Okay, so before we go back to our hotel, let's just talk a little bit about the shapes. Um, so an S orbital, right? When we say a 1S or 2S or 3S, the S means the shape of it. And so all S orbitals are spherically symmetric, um, as you can see in each of these pictures here, right? That they just get bigger because they're farther and farther away from the nucleus. A P orbital, um, its electron density is concentrated in two regions on either side of the nucleus. Sometimes they say it's like a dumbbell shape. Um, but notice that there's no such thing as a 1s orbital. It begins at n equals 2. Um, and we said that when we have the 2p, right, we talked about how in the 2p room or the 3p room or the 4p room, there are always three, in a sense, bunk beds, right? Um, and so that three are the different orientations. So for a p orbital, your p orbitals can exist on the x, y, and z plane. All the same shape, but remember you got to think in 3D space here. Okay, and then our d orbitals get even more complicated, right? d is when l equals 2, and there are five bunk beds or orbitals in these rooms. Um, and those represent all the different orientations. And then f is even more complicated, so don't feel like you'll have to draw these out. All right, so our main goal in this chapter is to determine the electron structures of atoms, the way they're distributed among various orbitals. Um, these are known as the electron configurations of atoms. Um, often I think of an electron configuration kind of like an address for an electron um, in helping us understand it. So in order to first write an electron configuration, there are three rules we have to follow. Okay, so rule number one is known as Pauli's exclusion principle. 
So this principle uh, proposed in 1925 deals with the spin of electrons. So electrons in an atom don't just orbit around the nucleus, but kind of like the Earth, they are also rotating. Okay. Um, so we actually have a fourth quantum number, which is known as m sub s, um, which is the spin quantum number. Okay. So the trick is, is that going back to our analogy of the hotel, okay? So we know on a hotel we have floors, on each floor are rooms, in each room are bunk beds, okay? Pauli's exclusion principle is telling us that one electron must sleep on the top and one electron must sleep on the bottom. Okay, they don't share the top or they don't share the bottom. Or more scientifically, they must have opposite spins, okay? They do not spin the same way if they're in the same orbital, okay? So the way that we draw orbitals is we draw them um, typically as just boxes, okay? So if I was representing the 1s subshell, put this down in your example, but I'm drawing up here. Um, so the 1s subshell, we draw like this, right? Because it's just a single orbital. That's why there's just one box. And underneath it, we signify that it's a 1s. So what Pauli's exclusion principle tells us is that when electrons are in this orbital and electrons we represent by an arrow, okay, the electrons would not do this. They do not both spin up. The way they would do it is one spins up and the other spins down. Okay. Okay, second rule we have to follow. So first, Pauli's exclusion principle. Second one is the off-ball principle, which means that the orbitals are filled in order of increasing energy. So we always start at the lowest energy and move to the highest energy. Um, the periodic table is going to actually guide us in the order that they are filled. So this tells us the order in which the rooms of our hotel are filled. So we start over here at the top, so kind of this, like our, our hotel is upside down. Okay, so the first room that is always filled is the 1S. After the 1S is filled, then we fill up the 2S. I mean, sorry, that's the 1S. Then we go to the 2S. Once the 2S is filled, then we go to the 2P. After the 2P is filled, we go to the 3S. And then we go 3P. And then 4S. And then notice that we go 3D. Okay, um, it's interesting that the 3D orbital actually comes after the 4S orbital. Even though it's technically lower on the scale, we find that it's better to have, in a sense, you could think a room filled. Our hotel makes more money if it's filling up a room and it's easier to fill up the room if it's smaller. So we fill up the 4S and then the 3D and then we go back to the 4P. Then we go 4 5s, 4d, 5p, then we go 6s, and then notice that this periodic table has moved up our lanthanides and actinides in numerical order. So it goes 6s, 4f, 5d, 6p, and then lastly, 7s, 5f, 6d, and 7p. Okay, we'll do some more practice with this in just a second. Okay, so Hun's rule. Um, so third rule we have to follow is that the lowest energy is obtained when the number of electrons having the same spin is maximized, which basically is meaning that electrons are arranged in a way to have parallel spins um, due to the fact that electrons repel each other, right? They're all negative, so they really don't want to be by each other in the first place. So what Hun's rule tells us is that when we're filling up an orbital, so let's say I have four electrons in the 2p okay so if it's the 2p orbital okay we know that the p any p sorry any p subshell always has three 
orbitals. Okay, one, two, three. Notice we draw them all connected because these boxes represent our bunk beds in the same room. Okay, so when we are placing these four electrons in there, okay, according to Hund's rule, rather than placing them like this, one, two, three, four, they would actually be like this. We would go one, two, three, and then four. Um, so the way I think about Hun's rule is that if they can help it, the electrons would rather be by themselves than to share a bunk bed with somebody else. Obviously, once the bunk beds are taken, then they'll start pairing up. But once again, according to Pauli's exclusion principle, remember that they must have opposite spins. All right, so let's try a few problems together, and we'll do some more of these on Tuesday, okay? So let's say we want to write the electron configuration for hydrogen. So the first thing you need to do to write any electron configuration is we need to know how many electrons it has. So hydrogen has one total electron. So the orbital diagram is when we draw the boxes and the arrows. So we always start on the first floor in the first room, which we know is the 1s, okay? And in this case, we just have one electron, so we put one little arrow in that box. So then the way that we'll typically write it, the electron configuration, we would write 1s1, where the one up top, represents that there's one electron in the 1s subshell or the 1s orbital, okay? All right, let's try another one. Let's try lithium. So looking on your periodic table, we see that lithium has three valence electrons. So once again, we start at the bottom. We start in the first room on the first floor. So the 1s in this 1s orbital, I can place two electrons, one, two. Um, but we still have another electron, so we go to the next floor, because there's no more rooms on the first floor. Go to the first room on that floor, so the 2s, and we put one electron in that room. So we would write 1s2 and 2s1. Okay. Let's try carbon. So carbon on the periodic table has a total of six total electrons. So once again, we start in the first floor in the first room, and we can put two electrons in there. Then we go to the second floor, first room, two, two, electrons there opposite spins okay I need some more rooms so there's another room on the second floor the P room once again the P room has three bunk beds so I put one electron on each of the bunk beds and notice that there's still an empty bunk bed and that's okay because carbon only has six so we're done so our electron configuration would be 1s2 2s2, 2p2. Okay, let's try sodium. So on the periodic table, sodium has 11 valence electron, not valence, total electrons, okay? So once again, we have to start at the beginning. So we start on the first floor in the first room, two electrons there, second floor, S room, one, two, two P, right? And this one, if we count, we'll get filled. So two electrons in each. So then notice that there's no more rooms on the second floor. And so then we have to go to the third floor. So we go to the 3S room and that has one electron. 
So we'd write 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and 3s, ah, write that in line, 3s1. <laughs> okay. All right, aluminum. Okay, I'm going to, I want you to pause the video and try doing aluminum on your own. And then once you have it, start the video up and check it and see how you did. So if I look on the periodic table, aluminum has 13 valence electrons. So just like before, we start on the first floor in the first room, fill it up, second floor, All right, so we've done two, 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 four, six, eight, ten. So we need three more electrons. Okay, so we go to the three S, one, two. After the three S comes our three P, and we just have one little electron in there. So our electron configuration, you should have one S, two, two S, two, two P, six, 3s2 and 3p1. All right, if you got that right, you can go ahead and give yourself two smiley faces. If you got it wrong, but you tried your best, you can have one. So you may have noticed that even with aluminum, which only has 13 electrons, um, it started to get quite long um, in how we did this. And so there's a way, in a sense, to shortcut or to do a condensed electron configuration by using the nearest noble gas that is lower in atomic number to that element represented in brackets. Okay, um, so for example, let's look again at aluminum. Okay, so we wrote its long version above or on the other table. Okay, so if you look at aluminum, look on your periodic table and find the noble gas that is lower in number to aluminum. So as you're looking at your periodic table, you should see that it is neon. So what we do is we write NE in brackets. So what this does is it takes care of basically our one through 10 electrons because neon has 10. So we actually don't have to do anything but the last three. So for the configuration, it would just be any in brackets, 3s2, 3p1, and you're done. So it makes it a little bit easier because the inner shell electrons are taken care of by the noble gas. Um, and really it's valuable to us because these condensed versions mostly show us the valence electrons, which we have talked about are really the ones that make the biggest difference or are the most important. All right, so go ahead and try to write out um, the electron configurations for these last four examples in your notes. And then what we'll do is we'll, these will be the first things that we go over together on Tuesday um, as we practice this a little bit more. Um, so make sure that you take note of any questions you have or things that kind of confuse you in this chapter so that we can discuss them on Tuesday. All right. Good luck.